Great. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Prince, and I'll be the moderator for this panel. We have an exciting discussion ahead, focusing on the intersection between two things we all love, food and design. So I would like to start off by letting our panelists briefly introduce themselves, and we'll get started with the questions right away. Um, we also have a Q&A section for the last 15 minutes, um, and our Slido code is DN2022. So feel free to submit any questions uh, and be prepared to ask them to our panelists. So we'll start with Joanne. Thank you, Prince. Hi, everyone. It's so great to see so many people in person. Congratulations on getting here. Um, my name is Joanne Chand, and I'm global CEO of Turner Duckworth. We're a design agency with studios in San Francisco, London, and New York. Um, I think I'm the oldest person in this room and on this stage. <laughs> I've been working at Turner Duckworth for 25 years. I was employee number two, and this is my second career. My first career was in the arts. Over to you. Awesome. Hi, I'm Allison Palmadesso. I'm the director of design at Chic Shack, uh, which is a global fast casual um, burger chain that most of you hopefully know and love. There's one at Hudson Yards if anyone gets hungry um, during the break. Um, and I'm based in New York City. That's where we're headquartered. And um, I'll tell you more about me in a second. So I'll pass it off. <laughs> so, uh, really nice to see everybody. I'm Hamish Campbell. I'm the VP and Executive Creative Director of Pearlfish in New York. Uh, so we're an independently owned brand design agency with studios in London and New York. Um, you can probably tell my British accent. I've been over here, but I've been based here the last 10 years running the sort of US side of the Pearlfisher business. And, you know, we do a lot of work in, in food and, and beverage. So. Hi, um, I'm so excited to be here with all of you today and on this panel. Um, I'm Raina, I'm a freelance graphic designer and public health practitioner based in New York. Um, and I do work across uh, many fields, but I'm really excited to talk to you about my work in food and in public health today. Great, yeah, thank you. So I would like to start off with Joanne. Your company, um, Turner Duckworth, has been involved in many numerous projects with many well-known brands. Um, can you talk a little bit about your company's recent redesign efforts with McDonald's? Yes, sure. Sorry, I was getting used to the clicker. Um, so Turner Duckworth is a branding agency, and we've designed the visual identities for some of the world's biggest brands like Amazon, Samsung, Levi's, Coca-Cola, and McDonald's. Um, this was a, it's still going, a five-year relationship. Uh, we started it in 2018. Uh, the McDonald's identity was extremely fractured, as you can see here, it's just it's, didn't have any really distinctive assets and it was very inconsistent the way uh, all the countries used um, the, the identity. And so from country to country there was so much inconsistency and also not enough differentiation. What we try to do is, is look at how we can break category norms and help a brand stand out. So this particular page actually represents five months of work, which is the part that one of the most important, important parts of what we do, which is to sort out what are the key equities in the brand assets that we should bring to life um, and activate. And we felt that the arches was a way to bring more optimism and what McDonald's calls feel good moments back to the brand. So instead of throw the, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, we were inspired by the arches, created a custom font. Um, that uh, optimism and sense of glow made its way into the lifestyle photography um, and also into all aspects of the visual identity we designed over the years. And we created a digital hub uh, to make it really easy for all of the partners around the world um, and also did a road show. Uh, that's part of what we do is once we design a visual identity, we go, go on tour with the client to all the major markets and help the client side and the agency sides understand um, the new assets. And making exceptions and not compromises, as some of you know who are from Europe, McDonald's is a green brand, um, so we have to allow for that. Also, we beta tested some new assets. We brought to life the fun, what's called Flossom identity across swag. And this is a really fun stat here. At the worldwide conference that they had, um, 
they usually sell about $80,000 of merchandise to their own uh, franchisees. And that year they had to get security <laughs> and they sold $500,000 in three days. So, I'm sorry, $500,000 yeah, in three days. And so it was a massive success. That moved on to the Uber partnership where we helped launch um, McDonald's with Uber Eats. And uh, you could get free swag with, with one order. And that inspired an online collection. And for the first time, you can actually buy these things um, as a consumer. We've also redesigned the uniforms. This shows how the sub-brands are different depending in the market, but it all kind of ties together and looks the same, whether or not it's signature brand in one market or maestro in another. We also designed McCafe. And for the 40th anniversary of the Happy Meal, we redesigned the Happy Meal visual identity and packaging. And also pivoting uh, during COVID, designing uh, for McDelivery, a whole visual identity and messaging around that. And most recently, uh, we designed the visual identity for the My McDonald's Rewards program. And very happy that <laughs> they published a fanual report. And last year, we were able to bring on 21 new members um, to the app and give away 2.4 million um, free fries and created additional uh, agency partnerships and a meal deal that has brought great success for McDonald's. And this is actually an example of, of kind of what we do is you can't tell the difference between what Turner Duckworth did on this slide and what the global agency partners did. And that's kind of what we try to do is create design that inspires because we can't do everything. We have to rely on other agencies to bring the work to life. And this is just a quick results that over the last four years, uh, the brand has moved up three places in Interbrand's best global brands, 32% lift in brand value, and for the first time ever, surpassed 100 billion in annual sales. And last year, they were named amongst uh, Fast Company's brands that matter, so. Great, yeah, thank you. So, um, Allison, I understand you. that your role as Director of Design Services at Shake Shack is primarily focused on restaurant design and architecture. Um, can you explain some of your work and how the design and appearance of a commercial site is related to marketing strategies? Yeah, absolutely. Um, are, do you think my slides are going to yes. pop up? Let me get these slides. So just a little bit of, about what I do at dire as a director of design. So I come from an architecture background. I have a master's of architecture. Um, my team is responsible for the new restaurant builds at Shake Shack. We do about 40 to 50 a year domestically and another 40 remodels a year. So a big chunk of work. Um, and if my um, photos come up, it was just going to be a voiceover for all that um, <laughs> we're working on right now. So since they're not up, I'll try to freestyle a little bit. So there we go. There we go. So the past few years has really been characterized by one, defining what we want our aesthetic to look like as we look ahead to the next generation of Shake Shacks, and two, really responding to the needs of our customers. So it's been characterized by a real format evolution with the rise of you know like digital uses like kiosks like you see on this screen. Um, I'll just flip through a few of these. And just really defining what our palette wants to look like as we look ahead to the future. Um, so, I'll try to skip to a few that are super relevant. Um, one second, sorry. So the, the aesthetic is really meant to be a lot like lighter and brighter and really heart back to the original Shake Shack in Madison Square Park, uh, just downtown in the city, which was a shack in a park. So you'll see a lot of kind of leafy green motifs in our shacks, but we always want it to feel really approachable. Um, and another huge thing that we did in the past couple of years is go into drive through which as a company that calls ourselves fine casual, not even fast casual, this was a big, big departure because we always cook to order. So kind of in this remote world, we solution drive through as a company, and I'd say that's probably one of my proudest accomplishments over the past couple of years, along with redesigning our furniture package, which you see here, um, opening a shack, and there's some more visuals of the drive throughs excuse me. Um, and just to kind of like pivot, because I know we have some more graphic design, photography-minded people um, on this panel, we also make a conscious choice as a brand with our art direction to really photograph our architecture, our food in context with all those high-level finishes that we provide as a brand, um, and our people. So you see people in our photographs, that's really important to us, because that's central to our brand um, for standing for something good. Um, we've also really am, amped up our digital uses, so you'll see things like order status screens, um, 
And I'll talk more about that as we go on, but here's a walk-up window again, talking about more format evolution for a brand. So it's really been, it's been a crazy couple years, but, but really exciting. Um, so I'll pass it off because this slide deck is way too long. <laughs> Here you go. Great. So back to the topic of McDonald's, I'd like to bring in Hamish. Um, your company, Pearl Fisher, was responsible for the new McDonald's packaging design um, that features very simple yet elegant designs that seem to reflect the recent trendiness of simplicity in art. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between artistic trends and packaging design as well as your work with McDonald's? Uh, flip to the wrong one, huh? Give me a second. And also, um, your Consider Pastures project. Yeah. Be great. Um, so, you know, it's, it's fantastic. You've got like two agencies. You both worked on sort of McDonald's here, and it was happening at the same yeah. time. Yeah. You know, like it, oh, geez, if I could control this, this would be better. Uh, you know, it was like a four or five year process, which is quite unbelievable how it is. And it's the vast scale of, of McDonald's, how big they are in every country or sort of globally, there was sort of. I can't quite remember, but it's almost like a, a billion touch points of packaging every day that we have to consider. And it's one of the primary pieces that a consumer gets to have a relationship with the brand with inside this. And, you know, as we saw in the sort of visual identity system, there was no connection with inside there. And they were using it as more of a marketing tool or just a shout. It used to have like huge, like Big Mac just written across it. So and there's no synergy across it globally. And this idea of these joyful moments coming back into the brand was so important. And a lot of the stuff we do at Pearl Fisher is about bringing that emotional connection to it, to bring it a smile. We're, you know, we're, we're a fast food burger. Let's not pretend to be in the house. Enjoy it. You know, if you're getting a Big Mac or you know, on your way into like class or on your way home and you can't be bothered to cook or anything, yeah, get some like hash browns. Like, let's enjoy it and bring that smile back to it. It was so important to the brand. So, so we're taking that point within the kind of packaging uh, it actually kind of really started with the inspiration of the egg McMuffin with inside it. You know, the wrapper is actually like a full kind of square sheet you can see with inside that. And the simplicity of just putting a yellow dot on that and wrapping it around to communicate an egg was all we kind of needed. That sort of purity of thinking that makes you smile. And the, you know, the, the dot's not a perfect circle, there's imperfection, so it kind of talks to the quality of the egg with, it, with inside that. And that kind of led off to the system of like, how can we strip back every single one of the pieces of packaging of when uh, we're talking about the sandwiches, can we just talk about the layering? So when it's the quarter pound of cheese, the cheesy element to drive element, uh, the flavor and sort of taste with inside that. Or then do we sort of talk about location, so it's a fillet of fish to bring this sort of ocean. And you bring the surprise and delight elements when you just open up the packaging, there's a little fish kind of swimming underneath it. So kind of bring that little charm and smile back into it and sort of break away. You know, there's this huge organization behind it, but they can still have that individual kind of moment to make you smile. But then behind the scenes is the scale of, of you know, their business and all the restaurants that are inside it. You can imagine the amount of people who work in the kitchens, every different language, every different education level with, with inside that. And the speed they have to get a sandwich out from order to the car is meant to be within 90 seconds. So with the vast amount of actually the communication, so when they're pulling sheets and different boxes that are outside it from the stacks in really quite small spaces, the, the ease of using sort of infographic language to break down sort of language barriers so they could easily see what the sandwich is. And some of these wraps actually sort of have different graphics on each corner. So they can be multi-use, which kind of helps in a sustainable front to minimize the amount of material we're sort of using with inside that. And, uh, you know, McDonald's is an amazing, efficient organization. And over the decades, they have trimmed every little piece off it to minimize cost and whatever to the speed with inside it. So to work out new shapes and areas to sort of bring in and find out ways where we can double use different uh, materials to really help that was a really kind of powerful tool. And um, it seems really kind of simple when we, you know, they spent four years and all we did was put a yellow dot on a white piece of paper. <laughs> but that smile that comes out of it and the, the amount of kind of sign offs you have to sort of build through, I'm sure you kind of experience through yeah. the visual identity <laughs> system is why it kind of takes out these, these big ships. But then when they can get that emotional connection right, you, it's not surprising you're sort of seeing the numbers of, of growth of where it's going. So do we talk about consider? Or yes, yeah. So um, your company has also been responsible for some very innovative product designs, such as the boxy egg cartons for consider pastors. Um, they're really revolutionary. I mean, when you think of an egg carton, you don't think of something that... Uh, looks so aesthetic. So can you talk a little bit about this um, this project? Yeah, uh, one of the things we do at Pearl Fisher, we sort of, 
work with what we call challenges and icons. So we do a lot of work with iconic brands like McDonald's, but Consider Pastures is a, a brand new brand creation with inside that. And this was really built out of trying to educate people to understand some challenges in, in agriculture with inside this. So uh, you've probably seen lots of egg cartons with free range hens on it, and they all look like they're running around in a meadow and they're <laughs> all happy and isn't that great and we should buy free range eggs. And for years I thought that was true. I believed the marketing of that, that this was the best thing, free range eggs. And I actually come from a, a small farming family and I know what, how good an egg is when a chicken's actually out in the fields and then the sort of taste and flavor and how good it is. But the FDA actually qualifies a free range hen to be uh, access to a window of the outside and only has a, a 12 inch square piece of area to be in. So every free range hen has never touched grass in its life. It's locked away in a warehouse with inside that and it's very sad where actually you're probably seeing lots of pasture-raised brands sort of coming out now, which means it is actually on pasture in the real life out there. And they're eating bugs, they're eating weird little flowers, but that actually makes what's so good about these eggs, all the nutrients with inside it, which the FDA hate, because they have no way of monitoring what they're eating with inside that. But it's really, so it became a bit of a movement to sort of bring this brand forward, to create, you know, consider as its name, to make you think about the food with inside it. There's lovely little identities where the, the monogram above it is the phi symbol for gold, and there's the CMP, and this idea of this gold standard of eggs, and that's elevated, it's a very, busy kind of shelf as well. You know, you probably see these in um, Whole Foods um, where it's behind refrigerated doors. There's a million different brands all looking the kind of same. So can we change the game and make people sort of uh, be seduced into buying these eggs and kind of want to put them on their sort of kitchen counter? So we kind of started out with a mission to really kind of uh, believe in the best choices and the consumers and what they're doing to consider about their kind of food. And we started with sort of attributes behind the brand where it's thinking about sort of care about the planet and what they're kind of doing, you know, cultivating new sustainable practices and considering every kind of choice they're kind of making. Um, and this led into this kind of disruptive kind of structure. And it's actually inspired by a very traditional way eggs were made. So we moved away from the molded fiber box with inside it. And this actually comes completely flat. So it actually oh. saves a lot of space from shipping this around inside it and have machines construct it. But it gave a lovely kind of theater as you open up and you're presented with the eggs there and you see all the wonderful speckles on, on their shelves. And then we can have the storytelling of their mission with it with inside it. And then using sort of foils on, on the recycled board to reflect that sort of naturalness that you're getting for the eggs really kind of tells a compelling story. But we actually elevate it almost to a fashion brand with inside this mm. to sort of sit there and make people really think twice about it. So unexpected to cause that disruption at the shelf. Uh, you know, you have very small visual area to sell your brand. It's actually the side panel is the most important. They kind of get stacked up like this. The top, you know, you wouldn't really sort of see. So he's got the idea of sort of uh, marameco and sort of fascia fabrics to really kind of give the idea of the shapes of the eggs with inside it to be like, this is so sort of almost bougie mm. that I kind of want this and to own it and I want this in my shopping cart as I'm, I'm putting it at the counter. And this kind of led through, uh, you know, big success uh, as it kind of went through, even the art direction, you kind of like, fucking hell, these are eggs. <laughs> like it's a full on sort of a fashion shoot happening here. Um, and we kind of gave them the problem that they couldn't even keep these on shelf. They were moving so fast. It went crazy on uh, social media where everyone's like, I need to meet these bougie hens that made these <laughs> bougie eggs like with inside it and create a whole new conversation and create disruption. But it has like a more powerful kind of meaning and purpose behind the brand that's kind of make change for that. And, you know, there's more and more kind of uh, pasture braised brands going out there and you're starting to see that in the sort of meat industry as well, which is fantastic to see. Great. Awesome. Now to a similar topic, Lorena, as someone who manages to capture the aesthetic beauty of food through art and design, um, what has been one of your most proud works? And can you show us a few examples? Yeah, um, well, we'll see, <laughs> we'll see the slides. Uh, I guess, I think the artistic potential of food is something I think about a lot. Um, and I think it, it's a really wonderful medium because of the ways that it engages with so many senses and allows for many opportunities for collaboration, community, and converse, like importantly, conversation. Um, so one work that I'm very proud of uh, was this kind of intricate dinner party uh, that I collaborated with uh, during my thesis year while I was a uh, graphic design student at Rhode Island School of Design. 
Um, here's the culmination, the spread that I, that I shared with uh, my dinner party members. And each element um, came from local farms who I was in contact with uh, across Providence. Um, all was sustainable, and I was able to really communicate with all the different people that were involved with bringing that food to the table. Um, I talked with people who drove food. I talked with people who grew food. Um, there are so many kind of intricate elements that go into the process of growing food and then getting it to your table. Um, and being able to have those conversations, invite people to come dine together that are involved in all of those processes was really interesting. Um, so here's the invitation that I shared with uh, guests, um, all of whom were involved in food to some degree in different ways. Um, and also the, the different ways of presenting food, both this kind of funny trough and ceramic dish um, I made with some different like food designers that I knew um, through school. Um, and then here's some images of the backstage. Um, these are two chefs uh, that worked within the RISD cafeteria that really helped me to make my vision come to life and put me in touch with quite a few of the farmers um, and, and different people in, in different stages of the kind of food process. Um, and through them, we were able to utilize something that's really interesting, which is buying power. Um, a cafeteria of this scale is able to really support local farmers in a way that an individual just is not. Um, and so being able to collaborate with them and um, support these kind of local communities and see how kind of bigger businesses are able to make sustainability really happen on a large scale was really incredible. And then kind of fun for me, weeks, or the week after I was able to see how my dinner party influenced the dishes that other students were eating in the cafeteria. <laughs> um, and so part of the dinner party was also kind of having conversations about food and about dining together. Um, so everyone that I invited was involved in food in different ways, and I posed these questions to them throughout the meal um, and had them kind of fill in these sheets um, and really like process their feelings and the ways that they engaged with food as a whole. Um, so I think for me, uh, food has always been a really wonderful kind of prompt um, both for you know having collaborations with people that inspire me, building community, and talking about a lot of things at once, which is something that's always very interesting to me. Um, I think interdisciplinary working is really at, at the core of my practice and what interests me, and also the opportunity to do a lot of research. Um, so one thing that I did while I was at RISD was I co-founded the RISD Food Lab, which was kind of an opportunity to do all of those things at once and really get to know other students that were engaged in this process and other community members um, within the, the city I was in that were doing work like this. Um, so, I mean, part of what I can speak to is like, how do you get started as a young designer and how do you make the most of being a student or being young and I think putting together projects like this and finding like-minded people is core to getting things you want done um, and, and, I don't know, finding what inspires you and getting it, making things happen. Um, so here's a few projects that I did. I did some, I did a competitive like food uh, creation. This was also in collaboration with uh, the cafeteria. Um, and whoever won got some free food swipes. So very <laughs> grateful for my support from them, but that definitely wouldn't have happened without making the effort. I think key to succeeding as a young designer or really anything is just trying and asking and making those connections. Um, here is some of my collaborators. We did a kimchi making workshop. We did quite a few different fermentation workshops and then that culminated 
in a fermentation dinner party, um, which was very fun and very healthy. Uh, oh. And here's a few images of different, th different things that we fermented. Um, this is kind of an experimentation and a design in its own. Um, my favorite was actually fermented strawberries. Mm. Uh, something to try. Um, and here is another research project that I worked on, which was about apology cakes. So there's, there's so much to explore in food, um, but here is like a very niche and interesting kind of meme that was happening in, in tiny different areas across the internet, which was that people were apologizing on cakes. So I did kind of a deep dive exploration of that um, and kind of put together a series of projects around the practice. Here's a fun, fun gif of some of my favorites. Amazing. Um, <laughs> I love it. And um, yeah, I think, I think what's really important is just to experiment and try. I mean, here's, here's some packaging that I made for fun. Um, you know, as a young designer, you just have to experiment um, with what you want to do. And so applying yourself to maybe products that interest you or projects that interest you can be really helpful in getting the work you want to do eventually. Um, here's, I, I guess, like pivoting to some of the work I've done more recently. Um, I've been really lucky to be able to work with the Center for Urban Pedagogy in New York on creating this uh, document um, for incarcerated people to stay in touch with their loved ones. Um, you know, I, I think like being so involved in research and being involved in work that invi involves collaboration and communication helped to lead me to projects that are really dear to my heart um, and really impactful. Um, so that's one. And then my last kind of I, advice, I guess, is that always look for inspiration everywhere. Create an archive. Um, I have a few food images that I put together, like that I think about a lot and that are fun. So I'll just flip through this <laughs> and show you. Like I'm always kind of collecting things that inspire me, and these are a few like fun kind of food food thoughts. So maybe a future dinner party or experiment in the work. Great, yeah, thank you. So I would like to shift to more open-ended questions. Um, back to Joanne. So um, when brands talk about defining their logo, what are some major pitfalls they encounter and how do you address those? So I, I guess sometimes brands uh, can do too little and sometimes they do too much. So. Really what we look for at Turner Duckworth is a great brief, uh, creative brief, and an understanding of the reason why a brand, whether or not it's 60 years old or hundreds of years old, we, we work on some brands that have that much longevity, or a new to world brand, we need to really understand like what, what they stand for. Um, and that comes through in the logo design. Um, but I guess, I don't know if, if that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, okay. th thank you. Um, we're gonna do like a little rapid round here. Okay, so, cool. Um, Allison, um, in this rapidly developing world, um, it seems that building styles change so often, almost like within every decade. So how does Shake Shack keep up with this modernizing world? Yeah, so I know I kind of raced through it before when I mentioned buzzwords like format evolution, but that's what really comes to mind for me in the food industry right now. If you look around to a lot of fast casual brands, they're really leaning into um, like mobile convenience, pre-order and picking up. So my challenge as an architectural designer is how to still um, extend the restaurant experience to our guests in those other formats. So um, an example with our drive through that we added, we started to think about how we can extend the Shake Shack experience um, under a string light patio or within the restaurant into the drive lane. So we added things like thoughtful light fixtures throughout, some string light canopies as you go through. So um, I think to answer your question, it's a lot about kind of convenience right now in the food space and figuring out how to make that still feel human and not too just like overly um, digital, so. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, and then one for Hamish. 
Um, can you talk a little, about, a little bit about Pearl Fisher's efforts to promote sustainability through packaging and design? Because I feel that's something that many, many companies do not really look for. Yeah, uh, sustainability is a, a really big part of our organization now. Um, you know, we made a commitment about five years ago. And, you know, our history, we're, we're a 30 year old agency. We do a lot of packaging, which means we produce a lot of trash in the world with inside that. And we need, we need to guide our clients and our consumers. And sustainability is a hugely complex uh, subject and a challenge. It's not just can we find a recyclable material, it's not that at all majority of countries globally don't have the infrastructure to recycle. You might put things in a recycled trash can, it probably still going to landfill, uh, which is like a really sad fact. And the reality of maybe this thing's about um, using materials that are biodegradable, but where are we sourcing them from? It's great, we've got this new material, but if I'm shipping from China to America, that's not helping either with inside that. So a lot of it is like, well, how, do, how can we help our clients with inside the actual materials they're using, but also the infrastructure around them, what they're doing, but also communication. You'll probably find a lot of these large organizations are doing stuff behind the scenes with inside it, changing things from maybe where they're sourcing raw goods from with inside that, actually having huge uh, like carbon impacts with inside that that consumers might not know. So it's also then also how do they communicate that in the right way that feels right for their brand and what their mission is and what they're doing because it's, it's a huge issue and it's going to take us a long time and you know your generation are the ones who are really going to help us sort of do that and help push brands to make sure they're doing it as well. So we sort of bring our expertise in and you know we work with material scientists to you know our, you know all our strategy teams as well to bring that bring that to the forefront. Great, thank you. And this question is slightly off topic from food, but it's for Reina. You worked a lot on graphic design for public health notices during the COVID-19 pandemic. Are there any similarities between food design and public health design? And can you briefly explain that? Yeah, I mean, I think that pu public health and food are kind of inherently connected in a lot of ways. Um, there's a lot of food subjects that are very related to public health. I think just off the top of my head, thinking about the FDA or about food deserts, um, I think the power of graphic design and art and doing whatever you can to make a conversation happen is um, that, that these mediums are, are ways to kind of bring light to, to difficult conversations and to have them. Um, so it's a way of like creating interest and it's, it's a way of engaging people on a way that they can relate to and that they, they want to be a part of. Um, so I think, I think that always like my, my experience doing research and putting together projects um, within food, um, I think in a lot of ways like translate over to doing public health work as well. Um, I think just in terms of, of my engagement within COVID-19 and, and other public health communications, I actually happened to be a kind of public health nerd before the pandemic. I was doing a great deal of research on um, pandemic visual communication, um, you know, two years before COVID-19 happened. So I just happened to be <laughs> very ready uh, to, to add my voice into the conversation. I think that, you know, ultimately like disease is very divisive and no matter what, what you're doing, and I think it ends up being even more important when you're having difficult conversations, whether that's about food or it's about public health, is that graphic design should use contemporary and engaging approaches. Um, they should be relatable to kind of the styles of the time, and they should also kind of push the boundaries of what is expected. So I think there's always going to be a need for like a careful balance of like trusting the viewer to um, kind of be engaged and be in the know and also providing like extensive information. Um, so it's like, it's a hard challenge, but I think, I think that there, especially in public health, is, is room to kind of push the kind of visual uh, language um, to, to create something that's more engaging and, and immersive, ultimately. Yeah. Great, thank you, yes. Uh, I would like to turn to the audience for any questions now. Um, we have two microphones. Um, we also have the Slido link, which the code is DN. 2022. 
Um, so please state your question, and um, it could be open-ended or it could be to a specific panelist. Um, and yes, we're ready to hear. Yeah, so our first uh, question will be from Dimitri. So this is for Joanne and Hamish. How has advertising changed since you started? How do you anticipate it's going? And this goes from possibly a technology perspective, but also in terms of understanding the consumer. As previously mentioned, um, people are much more aware of the products and brands that they're using. And this is partly due to documentaries and people being more informed. Do you see that things are moving in a direction of being more transparent and understanding that the consumer is more educated about the products and brands that they use? Do you want to go first? Uh, that was, <laughs> I'll go first. That was a great question. Thank you. Um, I've been in this field for a quarter century, and it's changed a lot, as you can imagine. We designed the Amazon logo 21 years ago, um, who, who really believed that it would sell more than books. Um, yeah, I think technology has changed what how our clients respond and show up in the world, and that by then ha has also changed the way our agencies need to service our clients. So with, as you mentioned, the increase in transparency, um, kind of being able to look under the hood and really understand how the sausage is made, literally and figuratively, uh, means that brands have to be more transparent and they have to take responsibility for who they are and they have to show up in a way that responds to social and health challenges. And that has changed the way I think we operate as an agency. We are a brand partner that's gone from a two-person packaging design agency to now a, a visual, visual identity agency and a brand partner. And we do a lot of comms design for our clients. So um, as an example, we had to respond to COVID and, and help our clients. Uh, design communications around that, especially for our QSR um, fast casual clients. Um, but also for our other clients like Samsung, which is in tech, we've had to respond to their crises, like when their phone batteries were catching on fire. So you can imagine like that a lot, a lot has changed. So a simple answer to your question is uh, advertising and design have changed a lot because the world has changed so much. I think in general, if there's a um, one through line, I would say um, we've witnessed the need for maximal simplicity because you have to be scroll stopping. Mm -hmm. So where brands live online and in real life, they need to be really telegraphic and unmistakable, which is why we really work to refine brand assets to a minimum and make sure that they're unmistakable and recognizable in a second, because everyone's attention spans have gotten a lot shorter. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I kind of echo all of that. I think it's the the consumer has changed massively. You know, the sort of if you build from you know, probably your grandparents as as boomers, the Gen Xers, the you know, the Gen Zs, and we're even thinking about Gen Alpha that's going on. And the younger generations are so digitally native with inside it; they have access to so much information they can find out what brands are sort of doing so there is demand for them to be kind of transparent and what they're sort of doing and be you know behave in a moral and ethical way which is fantastic that brands are doing this it's all really great positive change but i think also then culture when we think about inclusivity we think about breaking barriers of sort of gender and race brands need to connect up and be able to talk to that audience because you you guys are the audience and brands are now reflecting to you we we at Pearl Fisher, we talk about design for life. And it's about brands connecting to the consumers and what you're doing versus the other way around. It's not brands dictating that you need to follow me to be part of my gang. It's actually they need to relate and be there in a meaningful way with inside it. And brands that can then come out and, you know, I'd say advertising is one small area of branding. Brands kind of sit and where you're sort of seeing all the content that comes out will come from kind of systems like Tanner Duckworth might build with inside that. And it's carrying those clear message that consumers get, and it's there with a, a true purpose and an idea behind it. And those that get it right will be the brands that last for hundreds of years versus ones that might start and die away within a year because they haven't got that clarity and they haven't connected to their audience in the right way. All right, so for our next question, we have one from Bruvi Gupta. 
everyone. Um, this question anyone can answer. Um, so the question is, currently almost all food packaging is very bright and bold and, you know, all sorts of colors. Um, and all of them are trying to stand out when you're walking down the aisle of, like, you know, the food section. Um, what advice would you give to someone who's very interested in food packaging and very interested in anything related to food uh, while designing to still be able to stand out and still keep it unique? I think the food packaging people. Uh, I, I, I go for it this time, but please, I don't want to hold the stage. I think it's very interesting and, um, you know, you do see a lot of sort of bright colours coming out of it, but I think you've got to be careful not to jump on trends. You know, when you're sort of branding and whether you're designing a food packaging or a digital company or whatever, all the assets need to be related to what the brand is about. So if your brand is a very kind of like, I don't know, simple, why would you make your graphics complicated with inside that? So when you're designing, you always got to take it back to what is the core identity with inside that. I think what we're seeing now, why there's so much bright color is we're taking a movement of we've been living such a depressing life for two years. We need some energy and color and excitement and, you know, there's been so many articles over the last 10 years of a lot of blanding. You've probably seen lots of great brand marks sort of going very stripped back, kind of sans fonts and, you know, almost like identical. And now we want to bring back sort of self-expression. And I think that's what we're seeing in kind of culture. People are really pushing that way. So everyone's trying to find like, what is my new interesting kind of look? But they're also imbuing that into their positioning of them as a company. So make sure it always kind of reflects what the brand is. And then you'll sort of find that answer to how the brand should look and feel. I think I would just add, like, always lean into, you know, your unique style and do your research, um, you know, you're, you're going to find work that resonates with you and, and work that doesn't, and you're going to settle into kind of your own unique way of expressing, and that's what's going to make you stand out. Thank you. Yes, and now we're going to have a question from Zoe Zhu. For the all this hearing, I was so inspired by different perspective of like branding, packaging, and the art, or a little bit like interaction between like people, uh, human beings, and also like um, yeah, a different perspective. Uh, I'm just curious about. We all know that one really important element of food is human. It's like human taste it and experience it. I'm curious if you want to share a, like very impressive experience during your design research or your design final result. Yeah, want to hear a story about human and food. I can just hit one point, which is, um, again, coming at this from an architectural um, perspective, one thing I love about my job is I'm not just designing for our guest at Shake Shack, we're also designing for our team members, and I think there's something really human about that. So we're not just designing dining rooms, we're designing kitchens. So when we design the drive through kitchen, for example, um, we made it more glassy, and that was not just so our guests would love it, it, would so, it was so that our team members would experience some natural light when you're in these kitchens that are hot as ever. Um, so I'm really proud to work for a company that remembers not only the human element of our guests, but then also our team members, which we always put um, at the forefront, so. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, especially when, when working with, with food, um, there's so much to explore, especially in, in the realm of, of humanness. Um, like food inherently is like so related to cultural expression and community and family. Um, and I think I think it it will do do us all well to to think about like the ways that it is part of our practices, even you know, far away from like doing the branding. Um, so much, I don't know, like networking or like building of friendships happens over food. And I think, you know, thinking about how you can, I don't know, throw a dinner party for you and your friends, um, how you can celebrate your culture, your experiences, your research. Um, I think that that is key to like having. Uh, like a wonderful and creative practice wherever you end up kind of putting your skills to use. I can add a one anecdote about research and food <laughs> and how we use that to convince clients. We recently at Turner Duckworth redesigned the Campbell's Soup uh, red and white packaging, which is a very iconic brand and obviously 
co-opted by Andy Warhol and has been part of mainstream culture, but it really lost its way. And uh, we redesigned the whole range of packaging and all of the uh, brand assets. And you would not believe how many times we had to talk to the client and help them understand that we, we, we believe humans understand what a bowl of soup looks like, <laughs> and we don't need to put the bowl of soup as an image on the packaging. I'm really happy to say that we won that battle. And, um, and if you go to the uh, soup aisle these days, uh, you can see the new packaging on shelves. Um, but that is a use of research where we ask consumers to help prove to the clients that they really didn't need to be afraid of taking the bowl of soup off of the packaging and we could focus on ingredient stories. Okay, so for our next question, we have one from Nicholas. Yeah, so I heard a number of panelists uh, talking about sort of the pressing importance of keeping your designs contemporary. And so I was interested in asking how you personally define what it means to be contemporary and what it means to be designing for the present moment, and also how you keep your designs at once timeless, and then also referring to uh, what it means to design for now. I'll start. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> I, I mean, I, th I think there's, um, talking about like, is it contemporary? Am I just looking like the latest trend is, is kind of risk and similar to my answer before. Everything you should do should tie back to the brand. You know, actually a brand might need to feel more heritage with inside it. That might be building on sort of assets to make it timeless. You know, when you're working with brands that have huge amounts of history, quite often, you know, we will look back in the archives, you almost have to look back to like move forward and sort of take what's sort of meaningful and has so much equity. We talk about sort of KBAs, like key brand assets a lot with inside that and what's important and what's kind of in people's subconscious that you kind of understand. And then you put that against then culture, what's sort of happening and sort of find that sort of marriage between it. So you'll have key brand assets that will stay forever, it's, it's timeless, but they should be able to flex and change to be relevant for, you know, it's not just a period of time, it's also different geographic locations and cultures and need to kind of reflect with inside that. And a brand that can find, you know, its core sort of essence and its assets and then find playful ways to make it relevant for the different moments and different times and cultures. Yeah, just to build off what Hamish was saying, and our, our agencies are very similar in approach and we're always looking for what are those fixed assets and then building a flexible system. So the McDonald's work I showed you, we created the, the set of fixed assets and went on that roadshow and launched it in 2018, 2019. And every year since then, we've been continuing to work on, on, on how to help the brand show up in the world. Um, to design brand presence that has context relevancy um, and inspires other great work. And, and that's hard sometimes because we, we don't ever want to change those fixed assets, but we want to make sure that there's consistency. Um, right now we're designing, uh, for any football fans out there, we're designing the McFIFA visual identity for the next World Cup in Qatar. And we're using the same fixed assets that we designed in 2018, 2019, but bringing it to life for a, in a very different context, so. Yeah, I, I love this question because I think it's, it's really challenging to say what keeping something contemporary is going to be like because I think in design and art, we're always referencing the past and accidentally or intentionally. Um, and I think, I think what to me like, keeps the design contemporary and engaging and interesting is kind of pushing the comfort zone and making sure that you're not playing on like an existing trope. Um, for example, like when we were talking about public health graphic design, I think a lot of the time uh, we in the field end up sticking too much to very simple infographics. And I think like, if you look across the field that you're working in and you see a, a certain type of style like repeating itself, um, you realize that that way of communicating with others becomes a kind of like stagnant visual noise. It's like no longer engaging to the eye and it's no longer serving the communication purpose that you want it to. Um, so I guess like the core answer to that question is like doing your research 
and again, like developing like a, a personal eye and, and a passion for the field is, I think, what ends up getting you to a, a position of contemporary, yeah. Thank you. So now we have a question for Allison uh, from Zakai. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, thank you all so much for sharing the insights. So, um, Allison, I have a question regarding architecture and the work you have been doing. So, uh, when I'm like doing studio courses when, and doing like case studies on other like housing or like works, we have a, a great deal of discussion of how architects usually, you, you know, you leave their own unique mark or distinguished style in their designs. So I'm just curious, in your professional practices, how do you balance between the mindset of, say, um, leaving your own design style in your works versus that you're designing for a brand which already has a coherent design system or language? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I think what's really cool about working for a brand, I used to work at a large architecture firm where it's a whole different way of thinking, but the brand really is your muse, so you do use that as your compass. Um, I would actually say in my role, a challenge is to kind of take your design ego out of it. You, of course, want to put your stamp on it, but the brand is your compass. So for us, we look back to our original shack in the park, um, which is you know inspired by Art Deco, um, a little industrial, and um, as part of the mark, if you will, that I've tried to put on it is you keep those sacred cows, you keep the I-beam, you keep some of the corrugated metal, but try to move us a bit into the future, maybe translating some of the angles in our older shacks, and it was very heavy industrial, and instead make them more architectural and lean into natural light. So I think um, subtly infusing your own aesthetic, but working at a brand, I think it's so rich with inspiration, and a lot of people said that, like if you stay true to that core brand assets, there's so much inspiration, it's, it's kind of endless. Okay, so next we have a question from Nuri. Hi, I'm Nuri. Um, I really enjoyed this discussion. Thank you for being here. Um, my question is more about brands, so I think it would be more geared towards Joanne and Hamish, um, but I'm open to hearing from anyone who has thoughts. Um, I. I found the work, like some of the works that were discussed around the branding for McDonald's and also um, the architecture of Shake Shack really compelling and just satisfying the way um, you crafted those visual identities. And it, it exemplifies the way design can be this really powerful tool of communication and identity formation. Um, at the same time, um, I'm thinking of this test where like people are presented with six different kinds of leaves and asked to identify them and like they can't name a single one. And then you like show six brand logos and it's like immediate, you know every company. And I wonder about how like branding like can have this outsized influence in our lives and maybe displace some of the other relationships that we should have with our surroundings that for the longest time were so important um, and now have like slowly faded away. And so I'm wondering, like knowing that branding has like a, a really good side, but like could maybe be displacing other um, important facets of our life, what your visions for branding are and how they may align or not with the general cultural, culture in branding um, and what you think the future of branding is. Can you just clarify, did you say leaves like yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. That's a great question. <laughs> um, I'll go first. <laughs> I think that's a really difficult question. I mean, we are an agency and we are paid for, to do our services for our clients who create products and services. Um, and our logos and the detritus of our packaging work is on the streets and we have to be responsible for that. And as much as we can, influence our clients and uh, speak, building on what Hamish was saying, talk about sustainability in ways that we can all be better global citizens. Um, and actually, we should, we've mentioned a little bit, but diversity, equity, and inclusion has obviously come to the forefront since 2020 and in a great way. Um, 
through horrors, obviously, but in a good way in the sense that it has mobilized um, what I think agencies and clients do together, how we partner to, uh, to be more socially aware and uh, communicative. But in terms of, I think you're lamenting a little bit the loss of the focus on nature. And I think that's something that we should all think about. When I need to clear my head, I go outside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when our designers are stuck, I encourage them to take a walk around nature because that is, I think, our best inspiration is, is nature. And we need to protect we need to protect this planet and do more for climate change and a lot of the other social atrocities that are going on. We can only do so much, but you know, through our work and the power of our agencies, sometimes you know, we do social, social work and um, pro bono work. We've been focusing more recently on um, social and systemic racism. So at Turner Duckworth, we redesigned the Equal Justice Initiative uh, with Brian Stevenson, and then this year we designed Brotherhood Sister Soul, um, an organization in New York City that supports um, black and brown uh, communities. So that doesn't totally answer your question, but I, I think we do have a responsibility in the world, and we, we try our best for our clients and within our agencies um, to show up. I can jump in just with a perspective from, the brand, from a brand, which is, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head, which is brands are struggling with, you want to be iconic, you want to stand out like in a second, but you also want to always be relatable. So just speaking from the perspective of Shake Shack, when I interview people, they often talk about our signage, like our green burger is what comes to mind, and we're really proud that that's becoming kind of synonymous with our brand. But on the flip side of that, we don't build any, no Shake Shack is identical. And we go in with it to be a true community gathering place. We go in with it to stand for something good, which is our motto. So, you know, each opening we donate to a local charity. Um, you know, if there's art featured in the shack, it's not some random photograph pulled from the internet. We work with local artists in the community to elevate those voices. So I think you really hit on this kind of inflection point that a lot of brands are at, especially when they're growing rapidly is how can we still feel human to that earlier question, but still feel like a very, um, you know, a huge brand presence, so. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just one bit on there. I think where we are now as a, a society is actually there's a huge opportunity for brands to bridge that kind of gap. I think we're long past the kind of they stood there and we're lucky we can, we can afford them. Actually being integrated and consumers are demanding that they are doing more, that they're thinking about environment, they're thinking about uh, you know, inclusivity with it, with inside that. So I think there's opportunity. Brands are a big part of our culture. You know, you go historically, we heard about um, Andy Warhol and Campbell Soup with inside that. So it's been going for 70 odd years with inside that. And I think this all happening now and you look at work like sort of Patagonia is kind of doing and raising awareness within sort of the environment and and Gap have a whole, uh, or they call their Ascend program that really sort of bring um, diverse people into it so they can build uh, future leaders within industry. So I think they are starting to do it. And I think, you know, we work with these types of brands and, you know, we're still independent and we have really strict guidelines we have on our website that we won't work with anyone who's uh, unethical in their behavior. So as agency, we, we question our clients as much that they're doing the right thing. So we're prepared to work for them because we know what we do to them is going to have a bigger impact in the world. Yeah, I mean, just quickly, I think um, thinking about the power of, of branding and like serving kind of things that are important to us, whether that's sustainability or like social issues, um, there are a lot of organizations that you can end up lending your skill set to as a designer. Um, and I think one that like quickly comes to mind that was a client of mine that I encourage people to look into is the New York-based Center for Urban Pedagogy, um, which allows like new designers to get involved in projects that are really important to to us, like personally. Um, you know, ultimately, like you're all building your skill sets as designers or communicators, um, and there's a lot you can do, like on top of maybe working with agencies that align with your priorities um, to apply our skill sets. Thank you. So now we have our final question from Carla Rotenberg. Hello. Uh, first of all, again, thank you so much for the discussion. It was super interesting. Um, you touched on this 
already a bit, but this more general question. Um, we see a rise in interest in sustainability for food, which I think is super important. But at the same time, it still seems to be something that is very restricted to a certain part of society. So we can see that with Whole Foods, for example, these are all places that are usually coded as white, for example, or for a very rich audience. So you talked about food deserts as well, or there's also food swamps. Um, what can we do to democratize or like, yeah, make it more accessible, um, the sustainable food trend, um, which shouldn't be a trend and should be something that is um, affordable or available for everyone? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, there, there's things that we can do as, as designers and communicators. And I think like first and foremost, like what comes to mind is applying those skill sets to make people aware of the issue and engaged and interested. Um, but I think ultimately there's kind of two parts that need to go after that, which is actually getting involved in addressing the issue on like a community organizational scale and also getting kind of larger companies or organizations to actually invest their time and money in making that happen. Um, so, you know, the starting point can be like really utilizing like what makes a good brand or what makes a good design to garner kind of like community interest and involvement. Um, but then I think like each and every one of us has kind of the responsibility and the ability to get involved in things like, um, like co-ops and like food pantries and food growth and like bring those to areas within our communities where it's less accessible. Um, you know, sometimes like the best involvement that you can do ends up having to step away from like the design practice, but you're still using those skill sets, um, whether that's like organizing people and making sure people know about events, um, or, you know, it's literally just doing what you already know how to do, which is maybe like lift things and walk around. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, you know, as consumers, you can vote with your wallets. That's a huge impact. The, the consumer has the power to do that. And then from an AG's point of view, we imbued that with us why we're so committed to sustainability to build it in. And we, we work with large clients and, and small clients to have massive impact on, on the world. And democratizing it is such an important thing. These food deserts, are, horrendous and we uh, work, worked, well, still working with a, a new um, a new client of ours called Running Tide. They're up in Maine. Um, you know, on the front of it, they're, they're from a fishing background and they're oyster farmers and that practice hasn't changed in 100 years. It's sort of big plastic bags in the ocean do it. And the guy who owns that, he's an engineer and he's created uh, an automated way to farm oysters. And the average oyster farm probably makes around 500,000 oysters a year. He's gonna ramp up to be doing tens of millions a year with inside it. And oysters are made to be packed together. They grow the best way with inside that. And oysters are um, one of our key mollusks. They clean the ocean, they're a filter animal with inside it. So in fact, he can ramp it up, will actually help filter the oceans that we've made so damaged. You know, you hear stories of the Hudson River used to be clear. You used to be oyster bears, there used to be whales, go back 100 years with inside it. And people used to sell kind of oysters in you know, the little carton boxes, not sort of nuts and stuff like that. And by ramping up the scale of it, he also wants to drive the price of oysters down. So he take it away from champagne and oysters, like a one-off thing you might have at a nice uh, dinner on a date or something, to actually take it to be uh, oyster nuggets, put them in schools, you know, be able to be one of the, it's one of the best proteins that you can kind of have with the nutrient dense in it and make it aware for them, you know, people who, a uh, school meal might be their only meal you know, they get through it through a day with inside that and where schools are so desperate they only can afford poor quality to actually have great quality meat and drive the price down. So working with companies like this and agencies and we, you know, I think, you know, the agencies we're like minded that they're doing the same thing. But you guys can also vote with your dollars. If if a company's not behaving the way, don't buy them. They will change pretty quickly. Yeah. Yep. So quickly for Shake Shack, I think it's not lost on us that beef is not the most sustainable menu product. So we try to make up for it in other ways. Um, 
we source the most high quality ingredients that you can. We try to partner with people so, you know, regionally you're not trucking across the country unnecessarily. Um, for my team, the construction industry is another huge offender of just greenhouse gas emissions in general. So I just left a summit earlier this week where we were brainstorming um, with our consultants about how to be better. So we're looking into things like, do we harvest the rain off of the roofs of our shack to um, you know, like feed different portions of our building? Um, we have several shake shacks that have solar panels that you know, harvest a lot of energy. So we're starting to really try to lean into that and be very aware and push ourselves to always do better. So. That's great. I mentioned earlier the Brotherhood Sister Soul. They delivered their, I think, millionth meal in Harlem recently, um, having really uh, activated during COVID, and they just, they're just they opening their new building today. I think as an agency, we do what we can through our pro bono work um, and through responsibility uh, in partnership with our clients. I just a nod to all of you for showing up and for these great questions and what you can do is very different from what I was able to do at your age because of technology and social media and the power of your voice is much stronger than it was when I was your age. So if I were you, I would feel inspired and passionate, follow, you know, as, as you have, follow your passions, do what you love, and if what you want to do is help solve world hunger or climate change, there are so many ways you can through activism and through design uh, to make a difference. And as, you can, as you've seen through Black Lives Matter and Me Too and so many other social movements, design plays a really big part in that. And um, you don't need to be a big branding agency or a famous designer to do that. You just need to have a message that cuts through the clutter <laughs> Um, and that's powerful and authentic. And I think if you just really think about what matters to you and whatever you do, just do your best, I think you can make a really big difference in the world. Great, thank you. So actually, I have one last question. Just any short piece of advice for any of us here? We'll start with... I guess I just kind of said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I, yeah, that's true. I would say, yeah, follow your passions. and Yeah, yeah you kind of stole what I was going to say, too. So I think, um, you know, in architecture school, and I don't know how many of you happen to be in that, but it seems like a very rigid path. Um, and what really inspired me about this whole conference was just encouraging what um, design educations can go off and do in the world. I think sometimes you think there's only a few paths, but designers are really problem solvers and there's a huge need for that in business across all sectors. So I would just really encourage you all to just chase your passions, like you said, but just understand how valuable your mind is um, in the education that you all are getting, so. Yeah, I think, um, and it probably speaks to my personality a bit, ask for forgiveness, not permission. Get out and do it. Yeah. If you upset some people, don't worry about it. If no one's pissed off at what you're doing, you're probably not doing hard enough with inside that. You're never going to please everybody. So yeah. ruffle some feathers and get out there. You're like this an amazing generation that's shaking up the world more than I've seen anything. To do it even harder, like break everything, change it, fix it all. So yeah, go for it. All right, I have a quick two. I think one is that any creative that you talk to is going to tell you that their path was like very much like a zigzag and you really like have no idea how one experience is going to take you to the next. Um, so don't be afraid to pursue your passions and don't be afraid to like get off path as long as it is something that intrigues or interests you. Um, I think things end up really coming together and you know, like you said, like design can lend itself to many things. Um, you know, I wouldn't have thought I would go from getting a graphic design degree to getting a master's in public health, but these kinds of pivots are really possible. And the second is, um, you know, really create a, you know, invest in your community. Um, contact people that are doing work that's interesting to you. Um, be nice to people. You know, really build up the community that you're blessed to have, like both by attending this conference and being in school. And I think, you know, we all have the power to kind of build the creative community that we desire, which is one that's supportive and generous, um, both with opportunities and time. Yeah. 
Yes. Thank you all for a fascinating discussion and the fantastic questions as well. Yeah. Please give a Thank warm round of applause for our <laughs> panelists. Thank you. And that concludes. Thank you. Thank you.